All right, in this third lecture video for Chapter 7, by the time we're watching this, we've probably seen um, a couple of examples of how Chapter 7 energy balance problems work. And we're going to introduce a new term for a place where we can store energy in this lecture video. And then there will, will be accompanying videos showing that new term in fully worked examples. So the content of this lecture video is partially chapter 7, but it's also partly chapter 5. Because it's in OpenStax College Physics in chapter 5 when we actually talk about springs. We just saved that discussion for now because springs are really used in our problem solving in energy problems and not, not too much before. So the first new equation that we're going to introduce ourselves to um, is Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law come fr comes from Robert Hooke, uh, who in 1676 uh, came up with this um, understanding that to stretch a spring or to compress a spring, um, it requires a force. And that force is based on how much you have stretched the spring from its normal length. Now, I forgot to grab a um, spring from our physics department, but hopefully one of my cat's favorite toys um, is this little plastic spring toy. Now, we can see right now as I'm holding it that it has a certain length. That would be the unstretched length, where in Hooke's Law, we would set the initial x value to zero. We haven't stretched it from um, any, uh, any amount. But I can stretch this and stretch this and stretch this to a much longer length, a much longer spring, and to do so required that I have a force. Because if we think about what happens if I let go with this hand that I'm waving my fingers around with, the spring goes back to where it was before. It wants to be back in that standard equilibrium position. So when it is stretched, I am pulling one way and the spring is pulling back on the other, trying to get it back to this starting value. In the same kind of way, I can squash this spring and I am pushing on it. The spring is pushing back on me because as soon as I let go, it springs back to where it wants to, wants its standard normal length to be. So that delta x idea is thinking about the initial length compared to the final length. And more often than not, we'll tend to set the starting point to zero because all we really care about is whether the spring has been stretched or compressed from what it wants, what, what it wants to be, what its standard length is. You can have um, a longer initial um, length, and that's not a problem. We're still determining how much of a difference um, you make when you pull or um, push on that spring. Sometimes we'll see it written as kx or negative kx, and the plus or minus sign is not really what we should get hung up on. Instead, what we want to focus on is the direction that that force is pointing is always back towards its starting point. If we stretch it, if we pull to one direction, it will try to pull itself back to the original. If we push it in one direction, it will try to pull push itself back to its original. And so that's really the key part about anything that might have plus or minus signs attached to it, is that the spring is just trying to get back to normal. So when we think about Newton's third law, the easiest way for us to see that the spring has to have a force within the spring itself is because we are applying a force in order to get it to stretch or compress and this is just the spring trying to get itself back with that same amount of force. So if we were to um, set up a example in class, and we have this full example in class, but that's not where we are, um, what we could think about is if we hung this spring from a hook in the ceiling and we attached a mass to it, so like a little hanging mass we could just attach to it, then the spring would stretch by a certain amount. So although we can't do that full demonstration here um, at my house, <laughs> what we can do is, is think about the situation. So I'm gonna draw on the board and then I'll show us. So there's the um, original length that I'll be drawing and showing us in just a second. And once we 
add a mass to it, there's the new length of the spring. Okay, so we have, we have this. And the key thing here is that with the original length and the new length, the stretch amount, the thing that we would be calling x, doesn't really care about the length itself, but rather just how much of a difference there is. That's the stretch distance x, okay? So if I were to hang this mass and slowly lower it until it's stationary, if it is stationary, then that means that the net forces acting on that thing are zero, right? Because the um, any object that has no acceleration, either it's not moving or it's moving with a constant speed or constant velocity, has a net force of zero. So if we think about the mass on our um, slide right now, that mass in the bottom corner, and we think about the amount of um, forces acting on it, we know that there is gravity down, and then there's this new idea of spring force up. So when we are looking at those forces, we have the spring force up, and gravity down, okay? So those two forces have to be equal and opposite. The spring force is K times X, and gravity, Mg, which means that for this simple little setup that we have here, the K times X minus Mg equals zero. I already wrote that. I'll add mg to both sides, kx equals mg. And in the um, setup that we have in the classroom, we would be able to physically measure the x value. And we're told that the kilogram mass, um, the one kilogram mass is there. And so we would have one kilogram times 9.8. We would divide both sides by the measurable stretch distance x and then we get our spring constant k. So we don't have numbers to plug in at the moment, but let's imagine that we did come up with a stretch length. Okay, so I'm just gonna make it up that um, what we had was a stretch length of 12 centimeters. Okay, so I'm gonna make up um, what we measured, because it's not here for us. We're going to say that that was 12 centimeters, okay? So when we're solving for K here at the bottom, it would be 1 kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared, that's M and G, and then divided by not centimeters, but 0 0.12 meters, okay? So when we get that number, So 9.8 divided by 0.12, we're going to get, <coughs> we're going to get a sneeze, uh, we're going to get 81.7. So K is 81.7. If we look at all these units, they look like a mess, but Mg, we know that that's the force of gravity, that's newtons on top and meters on the bottom. So this new idea of spring constant is in units of newtons per meter. It's basically saying how much force would I have to fully apply to this spring to keep it stretched, to keep it stretched at a full length of um, one meter. So that would be 81.7 newtons per meter. Okay, so that number value probably wouldn't be the number value for my spring toy. This would have a very small, um, K value because it doesn't take all that much effort to stretch. If you think about the shocks in your car, there's there's components of that that are springs. They basically absorb all that, um, that bumpiness because it takes a lot of force to, to get them to, um, to move around or to stretch or compress. 
So now that we have this 81.7 newtons per meter spring, we can use that to figure out, okay, if we have that spring, how much can we stretch it for it to be exerting a five pound or 22.2 newton force back on us? So I'm going to erase the uh, majority of the problem so that I can do it and then show it to us again. So now what we're saying in this new situation, I'm gonna show it to us in just a second, is if we have it unstretched, how far can we stretch it, this new distance x, how far can we stretch it, this new distance x, if we know that the force is 22.2 newtons? So if the spring force is 22.2 newtons, and the K value is the 81.7 newtons per meter that we got before, we have the equation, and I'll use red so we can more easily track it. We have the equation that force from a spring is equal to K times X. So we would plug in 22.2 equals 81.7 X. So then we would have that we could stretch it 0 0.27, 0 0.27, that's in meters, and so this stretch distance would be 27 centimeters. Not unreasonable for our, um, for our spring to be able to stretch that much. Okay, so we've got these two kind of initial little quantitative examples to make sure we understand how the spring force really works. But the key thing is that um, we are here in chapter seven where we care about energy. So if we think about that force that's being applied to the spring, then we might remember to ourselves that work is force in the direction of motion times distance. And if we squash that spring, it would be able to push a mass um, away from it. Or if we stretched it out and there was a mass here, we would be able to have that speed up the mass um, back towards it. That means that there is work that we can store in a spring, but the problem is we can't use the force that we just wrote down, K times X, as the force in the work term because that force is not constant. It is very easy to stretch it a little bit. It is harder to stretch it more, and as the spring gets farther and farther out, it takes more and more force to keep it stretched that much. And so if we look at the graph on the slide, that's showing us how the force um, is increasing the more and more we stretch or compress the spring. And the work would actually be the area under the curve. But we don't necessarily even have to think about it as the area under the curve. We can just try to use the average force. In both cases, we will get the same result. If we think about this triangle as being half of a square, where the square is kx high, or not square, but rectangle, kx high and x across, then we would get one half kx squared. If instead we use the average force, then we would be using one half kx as the force, and then the distance would be x. And in both cases, we end up with the same result. We don't have to prove that result to ourselves in the future. The key thing is that we now have a term that we can write down, just like the previous two terms we've had, kinetic energy and potential energy of gravity, and this time it's um, the potential energy in a spring and it's one half kx squared. So this slide kind of um, shows us that if we have a spring that is not stretched, if it's just all by itself and no one's applying a force to it, it may have a length, but that's not what x is. x is the amount that we have stretched it from the original amount.
And the more that we stretch it, the more energy it contains in a way that is not based on a constant force, which means we cannot use our standard work term. We have to rely on the 1 half kx squared term, which would be provided to us on any quiz or test. And so we don't worry too much about that. It would just go straight into our list of possible places to look for, um, to look for energy. In the same place, uh, in the same way that in a previous uh, video, I talked about how if we think about this like a money problem, you might have money in your wallet or money in the bank. So we think about money in our wallet as maybe walking around money, kinetic energy. Um, and money in the bank is kind of like um, potential energy of gravity. Banks are very grave, uh, weighty institutions. And then potential energy for a spring is kind of like if you have some money stuffed in your mattress, so spring mattress. It's just another place where we can look to make sure we've accounted for everything. We're looking for three different places of energy instead of just two, but fundamentally our tool is still energy before plus work added equals energy after. And so we will see three different example videos from this section. Uh, example 7F, G, and H. But before we show what those examples look like and just um, describe them briefly, it is worth noting that in the textbook, they make a big deal about conservative and non-conservative forces. And it's worth knowing what that term is. It's not something that we have to uh, worry too much about. But a non-conservative force is one where the work done is based on um, the specific path you took. If we have a block and we um, have it go all the way around the table, that entire time friction is stealing energy out of our system. We will lose more energy if we, if we go around and around and around than if we just take the straight path. In the same kind of way that on our slide here, erasing um, this smiley face, we erase less if we take a short path and we erase more, we lose more of it if we take a longer path. The reason that we introduce this term is because some students are, uh, are always curious why the spring force and the force of gravity can have a term that we rely on, whereas air resistance or friction, we always have to go back to the standard work term. And it's because of that idea of non-conservative forces. A conservative force can basically give back all of the energy that we gave it. If we lift something up, if we lift something up, give it gravitational energy, it can give it right back again and um, give it back as kinetic energy as it falls. If I stretch this spring out, I'm giving it energy, it can give it all back again as kinetic energy and then it loses it when it snaps and makes sound and all that kind of thing. But we can make a potential energy formula for gravity, for springs, only for a conservative force. And so in chapter seven, those are gonna be the only two potential energy terms we have, gravity and the force of springs. Friction is a non-conservative force. It will take the energy out and there's no way for us to get that energy back into our system in a simple way. Ropes, so tension forces are non-conservative. If we push or pull, those are all non-conservative forces. We just have to build a work term when we see them in a problem and go from there. So the examples that we have seen from the first part of the chapter and the examples that we will be seeing after this lecture video, every single one of them has the same general process. We draw a picture, we identify before and after, we figure out what types of energy we have and whether we have a work added term, and then we plug in the numbers that we have and solve for our unknown. The most common places where we see students make mistakes are listed in this slide. I'm not going to read them all out loud. You can always pause the video or just pull up the slides that are posted on Blackboard um, to be able to, to make sure that you're not making these mistakes. But we don't want to, um, we don't want to get too ingrained in an incorrect um, setup. So, when we're watching these, en these energy videos, always try to see how one type of problem matches the next type of problem matches the next, even though each one of them has its own set of which terms are active and which terms are not. 
this list um, of common problems will help make sure that you are paying attention to the things that might be sticking points so that we can fix those mistakes possibly before we even make them. So the first example that you're gonna see a full video for, we um, have a vertical spring, we put something onto it so it's all um, stretched out and we hold that object down. All that happens before the problem starts. And then we let go of the thing and so it goes shooting up into the air. And we're probably not using a um, little spring toy. We, we have a better spring that can actually um, have a pretty significant force and throw that thing up into the air. And our goal is to find the maximum height. So there's that separate video you can watch to see how that one works out. The next one, we have a ramp where at the bottom of the ramp, we have pushed that thing into the um, spring. We let it go shooting forward up the ramp and we want to find how fast it's going at the top of that ramp. And then the third separate example video that's available to us is we have a um, spring at the top of a ramp, we squash something into it and we let it go down the ramp and we let it go as friction is slowing it down and slowing it down, we want to find how far it's able to go before it stops moving. And so we'll see that example again as a separate video and this is the kind of thing that we would do on the board, on the blackboard, if we, um, if we had that opportunity. So that's the end of the third lecture portion of Chapter 7. There's all of these different example videos interspersed. And the next time that um, we are looking at the lecture video, so the fourth part of Chapter 7 for lecture, um, we'll be talking about power and how that is an additional separate idea compared to work and energy, but how it is related and we can answer some uh, big picture questions about power, how quickly we use up energy. So I'll see you in the next one.